This presentation is an attempt to help good and I believe well-meaning people. People who I believe for the most part should be committed for their thirst for the truth and willingness to go against the grain. But they are also people that I feel have been deceived and led into a type of religious bondage by false brothers similar to that of the Galatians in the Bible. This group is sometimes called the Sacred Name Movement, although they themselves may or may not call themselves by any title, and they are often not connected to one another. It is for the most part independent teachers espousing variations of the same type of false teaching. The core belief is that the modern renditions of the name of the Father and the Son are pagan, and that pronouncing the names correctly is either part of how one is saved or, alternatively, just a way to keep from becoming cursed. There is a strong emphasis that there was a conspiracy to edit out the real names of the Bible in order to get man to worship the wrong God. I will list a few of the topics that I will be discussing. Baal the name or shame of God, the Tetragrammaton, is Jesus connected to Zeus, is Deus or Dios connected to Zeus, how did we get the name Jesus, what is the true pronunciation of Jesus, are we calling on pagan gods when we call on the modern names of God and Jesus, does Krishna equal Christ, where does the word Jehovah come from, what does the Bible say about saying the original Hebrew names. So let's begin with the topic of Baal, because it's something that almost all the sacred namers mention first. The main argument over the use of the sacred name usually goes something like this. The Hebrew words Baal and Adonai mean Lord. Baal and Adonai are also pagan gods of Phoenicia. Therefore, to use the English word Lord in reference to God is blasphemy. Now, if that logic is correct, then we should also argue this way. Molech means king. Molech is a pagan god of the Moabites. Therefore, to use king in reference to God is blasphemy. Another example would be Diana. Diana means divine. Diana was a pagan goddess of the Ephesians and many others. Therefore, to use divine in reference to God would also be blasphemy. You see, these common and general words only became proper nouns over much time, but that did not stop the common word from being a valid word to use. The faulty logic is in the presumption that if a false religion commonly used a title in reference to a false god, then this somehow taints that word and makes it blasphemy to use for the one true god. As validation for their position, the sacred namers show that the God of the Bible calls himself by the Hebrew word Baal on a few occasions. There are a few key Bible verses that are commonly brought up on this point. So let's look at a few of the main ones in detail. Let's start with Hosea 2, verses 16 and 17. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ish, and shalt call me no more Baali, for I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth and they shall no more be remembered by their name. This is taken out of context to mean that there will be a day when God will reteach them the correct way to pronounce his proper name, and he will stop them from speaking the false names of God, which they believe mean Baal. It's actually kind of a shame that the sacred name teachers have more or less stolen the depth and beauty of this verse from their students by simply reading it out of context and then quickly giving an interpretation like the one that I just gave. It is no coincidence that the term Ish in this verse means my husband and that Bali, which is a form of Baal, means my lord or my master. It is no coincidence because this entire chapter is talking about marriage. In fact, the whole book of Hosea is about marriage in a sense, and so is this verse. This is a good time to introduce you to the 2020 rule. It basically means that you should read 20 verses before and 20 verses after a particular verse to get the context so that you understand what the scripture is talking about. In the book of Hosea, Hosea was directed by God to marry a prostitute, which he did. The prostitute kept sleeping around with other men, even after they were married. And Hosea was surprised when God told him after that to go get her and bring her back into his house and love her and remain married to her despite her unfaithfulness to him. Marriage here is symbolic of the covenantal relationship between God and Israel. Israel has been unfaithful to God by following other gods and breaking his commandments. So Israel is symbolized by a harlot who violates the obligations of marriage to her husband. 
But Hosea represents God and his grace and mercy to the rebellious Israel and how he keeps bringing her back despite its unfaithfulness. The first part of this chapter is explaining the many transgressions of the symbolic wife, Israel, and how she worshipped other gods, including Baal, and offered sacrifices to him. It talks of what the wife deserves for this adultery. But then, in the two verses before these verses that we just read, God, in his grace, begins to call her back to him. The two verses before this say, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her vineyards from thence and the valley of Angkor for a door of hope. And she shall sing as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. So even after a long talk of her unfaithfulness and idolatry, God says he will make their relationship like it was after Egypt when she was faithful. And then we have the passage in question, which says, And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ish, and shalt call me no more Baali. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. The Hebrew words Ish and Baal, the root of Baali, are both translated by the English word husband in other places in the Bible. Ish is a very interesting word, which we will look at in more detail later. But... It is translated as husband in 69 verses, while Baal is translated as husband in only three verses. The connotation is that Ish is like a relational husband, and Baal is a lord or master over his wife. God is saying in this verse that in the future there will be a different relationship between him and his people, and they will call him husband instead of a type of master, and they will be a family not a type of slave. The fascinating part about this is that the prophet Jeremiah was also told by God to make this exact same prophecy. Also realize as I read it that in verse 32 it's one of the other three places in the Bible where the word Baal is translated as husband and that's not a coincidence. Behold the days come saith the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. These two prophecies are about a future covenant. Another way to compare them is the last verse in that section in Hosea, which says, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. And that's also how Jeremiah 31, 33 puts it, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. This is the interpretation of Hosea 2, verse 17. It literally has nothing to do with the changing of the proper name of God. That interpretation only works out of context and with a false or deceived teacher. Another verse that is used to attempt to show that there was a conspiracy to insert Baal for the true name of God is found in Joshua 11, verse 17. Even from the Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir, even unto Baal God in the valley of Lebanon, under Mount Hermon, and all their kings he took and smote them and slew them. The idea here is that the name of the region Baal God is evidence that the term God in the English language is connected to Baal. They will say things like, if you say that you worship God, you are really worshiping Baal, and this is their proof text. But Baal God is a compound name. And like other places in the region, even to this day, there are compound names using the term Baal. One example is Baalbek, and it no doubt is a place that Baal was worshipped in times past. But the word God, G-A-D, that it's similar in sound to the modern word God, G-O-D, is pure coincidence. The English word God derives from the Proto-Germanic root, and not the Semitic, so it's logically impossible that these words have similar origins. This is one of those that the smart sacred namers refrain from using because of the 100% lack of any etymological evidence. God, G-A-D, is another ordinary common noun in Hebrew that has no connotation to the Lord. It means good luck. Genesis 30.11 says, Then Leah said, What good fortune! So she named him God. 
So it is not surprising that the Hebrew word for good luck became a proper noun, as we see here in this compound name for this place. The final Baal verse we're going to look at is in Jeremiah 23, verse 26. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The sacred name interpretation is that the lies spoken of here is the editing of the name Baal in the place of God in the text. And now God is upset because everyone has forgotten his proper name. So let's look at these verses in context. Look at the first part. Notice he is talking about prophets and prophecy. It says, How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies, even the prophets of deceit of their own heart? So, it seems that the problem was prophecy. Not that the scribes had changed all the text to a different name. But, if this were true, we should see some evidence that there were false prophets prophesying in the name of Baal. As well as some further evidence that they were causing people to believe Baal instead of God to explain verse 27. Well, that's easy. Just look 13 verses before this and you will find exactly that. And this is another example of the 2020 rule. Jeremiah 23 verse 13 says, And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied by Baal and caused my people Israel to err. So when you put this verse with the earlier verses, you will see that they are in perfect harmony. And now that you know the context of the verse, which is that there were prophets of Samaria prophesying by Baal, apparently by going into some kind of dream state, as we see in verse 27, and this was seducing the Israelites to err, it's obvious that this passage is not talking about the proper name of God being changed at all. This brings us to another topic, one that I think is at the very heart of the sacred name ideas, which is the very Hebrew word for name, which is Shem pronounced shame. We might as well stay in the same chapter of Jeremiah, chapter 23, because earlier there is a wonderful prophecy of the Messiah made. It's in verse 6. It says, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is the name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Now, wait a minute. That's not the proper name for the Messiah, is it? What about other places, like in Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6, where it says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now wait a second, how many names is the Messiah going to have? At the heart of the sacred name movement is a fundamental misunderstanding of the Hebrew word for name, which is shame. Many sacred name teachers basically scare people with verses like this in Psalm 9, verse 10. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. So, do these verses speak of the proper name, or is name a more broad title than the sacred namers would have us believe? Even in English, we should be able to understand this, because our English word for name has a very broad use as well. Webster's Dictionary says it can be a proper name like Bob, or a designation like he was king in name only, or an appellation, title, epitaph applied descriptively or in honor, or it can be a reputation of a particular kind given by common opinion. An example would be to protect one's good name, or a distinguished, famous, or great reputation like fame. An example would be to make a name for oneself or a widely known or famous person or celebrity, like she's a name in show business, or a personal or family name is exercising influence or bringing distinction, like with a name like that they can get a loan in any bank of town. It can be a body of persons grouped under one name as a family or clan, the verbal or other symbolic representation of a thing, event, property, relation, or concept. Like our English word name, shame in Hebrew has several meanings besides the literal one. One way that it is used in the Bible is to mean the essential reality of who someone is, as in Proverbs 21, 24. A proud and haughty person's shame is scorner. In Exodus 34, 14 we read, The Lord, whose shame is jealous, is a jealous God. In a more famous example, the prophet Isaiah gave him the Messiah's shame as being 
Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Eternal Father, the Ruler of Shalom, in Isaiah 9, verses 5 through 6. The plural form of shame is Shemot. The Bible has many Shemot for God, which are royal titles and revelations of the reality of who He is, but not names as such. In Biblical Hebrew, to trust someone's shame means to trust Him because of who He is. To bless someone's shame means to bless Him because of who He is. So when you see verses like, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy shame? You can be sure that shame is about who God is. So let's transition from this into the Tetragrammaton, or the four letters YHWH, because it will be an important thing to understand when looking at all the other claims of the sacred namers. The key passage for understanding the Tetragrammaton is in Exodus 3, verses 13. Moses asks God what his shame is. We see that God answers the question in a very interesting way, a way that is to this day a mystery to many scholars. It says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his shame? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. The Hebrew words for I am that I am is Haya Asher Haya, and the word Haya is the short version meaning only to be, or in this tense, I am. It is most often translated in the Bible as some form of the verb to be. An example would be in Genesis 44, verse 24. It says, And it came to pass, when he came up unto the servant, my father, we told him the words of the Lord. The words, And it came to pass, is the single Hebrew word for Haya, or to be. Yahweh and Haya, or Eya, are both from the same verb, Haya in Biblical Hebrew. Uh, it's spelled Hawa in earlier Hebrew. By the way, the Hawa root does show up in the Biblical Hebrew as well, but it is more common in the Aramaic portions. Yahweh is the third masculine singular form, probably in the Hiphal stem. Eya, or Haya, is the first common singular in the Qual stem. Yahweh would mean He who causes to be, and Eya, or Haya, would mean I am. So, Yahweh is in most places the third person masculine singular conjugation of the root Haya. This is the tense you would use if you were referring to God, as opposed to God referring to himself, because God's name is a verb. It's kind of like in English, if I said my name is I am that I am, other people would refer to me as he is who he is. Keep in mind that this is much too simplistic of an example considering the intricacies of this verb, but you get the idea. There is a sect of sacred namers that say that Haya or Eya is the only true name of God, and that the YHWH or the Tetragrammaton is a Kabbalistic forgery. Now this is of course ridiculous because the Kabbalah is based on Rabbinic Judaism, and the Tetragrammaton predates that by hundreds of years, so that's impossible. The reason they think this is very basic. That is because they appear to be different words. But that totally disregards the fact that Hebrew grammar is the reason why it is rendered YHWH in the third person. I emailed one of the premier scholars of ancient Hebrew alive today, and his response to this question was as follows. When God reveals the covenant name, he says his name is I am that I am. This is the first singular form of Haya. Nothing else it can be. Yahweh is the same root, just a third person grammatically in a different stem. So what is this mysterious word in this mysterious tense called the Tetragrammaton? The term Tetragrammaton comes from the Greek meaning a word having four letters. It refers to the Hebrew name of the God of Israel. These four letters are usually transliterated from Hebrew as IHVH in Latin, JHWH in German, French, and Dutch, and JHVH or YHWH in other languages. The original pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton is difficult to be determined with absolute certainty. The reason is partially because the correct pronunciation has been lost to history due to a fear of breaking the commandment of taking the Lord's name in vain, because the late Jewish culture only allowed the high priest to say it. 
you can look over Hebrew scholarly literature to find the grammatical reasons that there is a lot of speculation on how to pronounce it, but I will simply say that it is a very difficult thing to know with certainty. Which makes me very sad to see all the teachers of the sacred name movement have their dozens of variations of the pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton, each one saying that God will send people to hell if they don't choose the one that they have come up with based on their particular method. Now, I'm not going to try to tell you the true pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton in this presentation, even though I think I have a good idea. I think it would be presumptuous of me to think that, if all the Hebrew scholars combined aren't sure about its pronunciation, that I somehow could figure it out beyond any doubt with my research. I hope to give you something much better than that by the end of this presentation, though, and that is the shame of God and freedom from bondage. There are pronunciations that I can be relatively certain are not the correct pronunciations of the Tetragrammaton. One of those that I feel I should mention is Jehovah. And it was probably first used by Raymond Marti, who was a 13th century Catechan Dominican friar and theologian, so it's a pretty recent thing. In early Bible translations, when the reformers started to translate the Bible into their own languages, despite the Catholic Church's opposition and persecutions, William Tyndale was the first to translate considerable parts of the Bible into English. Tyndale spelled the name of God Jehovah. We will look at how he came up with that name in a moment. But because he published in Germany, the German version would transliterate the letter I as J, because in Germany, when they wanted to say the yes sound, they most often used the letter J. Later on, as people read this German translation, they pronounced it differently because, for instance, the French looked at the same letter and pronounced it with a hard J sound, and the English speakers adopted the French practice. The name Jehovah then appeared in all early Protestant Bibles in English, except Coverdale's translation in 1535. The name Jehovah appeared in John Rogers' Matthew Bible in 1537, the Great Bible of 1539, the Geneva Bible of 1560, the Bishop's Bible of 1568, and the King James Version of 1611. More recently, it has been used in the Revised Version of 1885, the American Standard Version of 1901, and the latest one was the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures of the Jehovah's Witnesses in 1961. Notice that there are no modern translations on the list that uses Jehovah other than the Jehovah's Witnesses New World Translation. Most other modern translations have stopped rendering the name Jehovah. The reason is because the reason the early scholars believed it to be the correct pronunciation is now known to be false. It was not a conspiracy, but an honest mistake. Let's look at it. Some of you are aware that the written Hebrew does not have vowels which were not needed because, for much of its history, Hebrew tradition was passed down orally, and so were the correct pronunciations. Then, over time, as the pronunciations were lost to history, as the language was starting to die out after the diaspora, there was a system of adding vowels created to help modern speakers pronounce the words. This was done by using several dots and other marks that were supposed to signify that you were to use a certain vowel sound when pronouncing the consonants. This was developed in the 13th century by the Masoretes, or Masorites, a family of Jewish scribes. It was important to note that it is unlikely that the Masorites even knew the correct pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton. We know this because they, like most late Jewish people, developed a fear of pronouncing the name of God because they were very concerned about breaking the commandment not to take the Lord's name in vain. So, what they did when writing the Tetragrammaton was they substituted terms like Adonai and Elohim, or God, titles for God to replace the divine name. But, instead of actually changing the word, they would only insert the vowel markers of Lord and Adonai, not the words themselves, to indicate to the reader that these substitutes were to be used. So, people would see the Tetragrammaton, yet with the vowel markings of the substitute names. Later on, when modern translators read the Tetragrammaton with the vowel signs for the replacement names, they followed the guidelines of the vowel markings as if they were the true markings of how to pronounce the Tetragrammaton. And this is where the pronunciation of Jehovah or Ehovah came in. But we now know why the vowel markers were there, and we understand that the pronunciation of Jehovah or Ehovah is a filological impossibility. But, as I mentioned, there are more than a few groups out there that have entire doctrines resting on this pronunciation. And so, they say it must be that the vowel points are inspired and that they existed in the earliest forms of Hebrew. This is a view that is not supported by modern scholarship in the main. Let's move on to a different claim. 
Many sacred namers claim that YHWH is derived from the pagan word for Zeus. In fact, Zeus comes up quite a lot with the sacred namers, and we will look at him again as we investigate the name for the Messiah later on. There are many variations of this claim, which usually means that there is a lot of people simply repeating other sacred namers and not doing any investigation of their own. So, I'm going to have to debunk several variations of this claim. The first claim is that the Latin name for Ihov, or Jove, which is an alternative poetic name for Jupiter, which is the same god as Zeus, is related to the Semitic root Hawa, from which the Tetragrammaton is derived. A certain amount of people that make a big deal of this claim basically point to the superficial similarity between the words Jove and Jehovah. But, as we have seen, it doesn't really make any sense because the name Jehovah is about the one name for God that you can rule out. Nevertheless, some take it a step further and say that the Jove is from the Indo-European Dio. And since there's also an early Hindu deity called Dias Pita in Sanskrit, and since D in Sanskrit regularly corresponds to Z in Greek and J in Latin, we can be reasonably certain that they go back to something like Dios, or the title Pater, meaning father. The Norse god Tyr probably has a descendant of the same name too. However, it's impossible that Yahweh is related because unlike Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, and Old Norse, which are Indo-European languages, Hebrew is from the completely unrelated Semitic language family. It's basically a coincidence and I might submit not even a particularly profound one. The other claim about Zeus is that it has connotations to Deus, the generic Latin word for God. This one is actually more or less correct, and it's actually one of my favorite claims because people show that the word Deus and Zeus are connected, and they act as if people thought that Deus, or deity, was a name only intended for the one true God, when in fact even the Latin dictionaries say that it's a general term for deity. The Bible in several places refers to other deity. Although they are created by God and lesser than him, he still gives them titles as gods or Elohim. In the same way, having a general word for God and gods is natural in many languages, and they derive from all kinds of places. People say that we shouldn't call God God, but I would say that they are missing the obvious point, which is that it's a noun. It's like saying, the Most High is the one true God, or Baal was a wicked and pathetic God. It's simply a descriptive tool that we have in the English language. Now let's look at the name of the Messiah. Sacred namers will say that using the name Jesus is pagan, or if you use it, you're calling on pagan gods. Is this true? To start off, I will debunk the idea that there is a connection between Jesus and Zeus. This one has become really popular on the internet, but you should know if you believe this that even the majority of the sacred namers don't believe this. They reject it because there's a complete lack of etymological evidence and that people often call them out on this. So here's one quote from a sacred namer website about the Jesus-Zeus connection. It says, We have never used the argument that Jesus is somehow a compound of Jesus, Zeus being the chief god of the Greek pantheon, Although, there is a certain and extreme degree of assonance, which is the core of the art of transliteration, with the Jesus word. We have never pursued that possibility to any extent since it is totally irrelevant. We know exactly where the name Isius came from. It was a natural Greek way of rendering the Hebrew Aramaic name Yeshua at least two centuries before his birth. And it is the form of the name found in more than 5,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. The apostles, Paul, Peter, Mark, Luke, Jude, all chose to translate Yeshua as Isius when writing in Greek. That should validate that it's not a damnable sin for anyone to transliterate the name. The name Isius is also found in Greek writings outside the New Testament and dating to the same general time frame. Yes, some people claim that the Encyclopedia Britannica says that the name Isius is a combination of two mythical deities, Eu and Zeus or Zeus. It actually says no such thing. It's a total lie. In short, as one Jewish believer said, Jesus is as much related to Zeus as Moses is to mice. Some sacred namers claim that the name Christ comes from the word Krishna, and therefore, if you say Christ, you are giving homage to a pagan god. They quote Albert Pike as a main source for this claim. There is absolutely no etymological similarity between the words Krishna and Christ. The Sanskrit word is called Kursna, and has a literal meaning of black, or dark, or dark blue. 
and is used as a name to describe someone with dark skin. And pictures of Krishna are often depicted with blue skin. Christ is an English term for the Greek word Christos, meaning the anointed. In the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, Christos was used to translate the Hebrew Mashiach, meaning one who is anointed. Christos, in classical Greek usage, could mean covered in oil, and thus it's a literal translation of Mashiach. The Greek term is thought to derive from the Proto-Indo-European root of gere, to rub. Clearly then, why both words have a similar initial sound, they have totally different etymologies. Also, Krishna is the proper name for a Hindu deity, whereas Christ is not a proper name, nor is it a surname, it is a title. Christos existed in ancient Greek and is a common word long before it was appended to the Messiah. You can follow me step by step through the transliteration of this name to see how it came about. Transliteration is the practice of converting a text from one writing system into another in a systematic way. As you can see from these graphs, the Y was translated into an I in Greek. This wasn't a conspiracy. This was because there was no Y in Greek, and I was the closest letter available to make that sound. The first sound of the second syllable of Yeshua is the SH sound. It is represented by the Hebrew letter SHIN. However, Greek, like many other languages, has no SH sound. Instead, the closest approximation, the Greek SIGMA, was used for transcribing Yeshua as Isius. The final sigma, or S, added at the end of Isius occurs in the standard transliteration of the proper masculine noun from Hebrew to Greek. Greek nouns and names almost always have case endings. The same is true for names like Nicodemus, or Judas, Lazarus, and others. The sigma, or S, is added at the end of the word to distinguish that the name is the masculine form. It also makes the name declinable. If you notice that the word Isius is rendered in the genitive form as Isio, you'll notice that there is no final sigma. So, I hope so far you can see that there is nothing pagan about the name Jesus. So the question is about the J. Why was it added in modern English? Was it a conspiracy? Does the J somehow make the name Jesus pagan? The IA got changed to a JE in order to make it pronounceable for Germans and we English speakers saw their spelling and pronounced it the way we pronounce J's, which we pretty much got from the early French. It's just how languages develop. It is true that Jesus is not how his disciples or his friends pronounced his name. Two questions then arise. One, well, how was his name pronounced then? And the second one can also apply to the Tetragrammaton, which is, are we supposed to say the Hebrew name to be saved, or is there some extra power or blessing for saying his name in Hebrew? So let's look at the first question, which is, what is the true pronunciation of the Messiah's name? Ten Hebrew leaders had the name Yehoshua. The Aramaic form was Yeshua. The sacred name argument is that the name Jesus is a corruption and should be translated Joshua or Yehoshua. But this does not take into consideration that the Aramaic name for Joshua or Yehoshua was Yeshua. Since Aramaic was the spoken language at the time, he would have been called Yeshua. The name Jesus is the Greek equivalent to Yeshua. This Greek transliteration is as close to the Aramaic as the Greek language would allow. Among the Jews of the Second Temple period, the Biblical Aramaic Hebrew name Yeshua was common. Nearly one out of ten persons from that period was named Yeshua. In the Septuagint and other Greek language Jewish texts, such as the writings of Josephus and Philo of Alexandria, Isius is the standard Koine Greek form used to translate both of the Hebrew names Yehoshua and Yeshua. Greek, or Isius, is also used to represent the name Joshua, son of Nun, in the New Testament passages Acts 7, 45, and Hebrews 4, verse 8. It was even used in the Septuagint to translate the name Hosea in one of the three verses where this referred to Joshua, the son of Nun, in Deuteronomy 32, verse 44. So, it's my personal opinion that Yeshua, or Yeshua, is the original form of the Lord's name, but that as we have clearly seen, Isius, or Jesus, is a natural transliteration. The question is, should we use transliterations? Is there a blessing or a curse if we recite the names in the original form? This is a really important question, too, because all the known world transliterates the Hebrew name Yeshua into their own tongue. 
For example, the Japanese pronunciation is Yasso. The French is Jesu or Jesu, depending on what part of France you're in. In Spanish, it's Jesus. In Arabic, it's Isa. In Fijian, it's Chisu. So, are all these people going to perish because they had to transliterate the Lord's name in order to write it? Here are some things to consider about that. The author of the languages of man was the Most High God, who confused the languages at Babel. The assumption that the languages themselves are pagan in origin implies that God is the author of the pagan religions of man. Another often overlooked point is that there is nothing in the Bible that would suggest that saying the name of God in Hebrew gives any special power. There is no instance in the Bible of the name of God being a kind of magic word that one must say correctly. I find it kind of funny that we do see this attitude developing much later with the Kabbalah. I say funny because the sacred namers are supposedly doing what they're doing because they don't want to be practicing witchcraft. But if you look at their theology objectively, it's the gospel of incantation, a form of salvation by reciting the appropriate magic formula. In other words, the Kabbalah, or witchcraft. The same Luciferian doctrine of secret knowledge is the basis for the rightness before God. By its definition, it's another gospel. As Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9 says, As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach another gospel unto you that ye have not received, let him be accursed. One of the best validations of transliterations is the fact that they were used by the apostles and other New Testament Bible writers. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. Paul, Peter, James, John, Luke, and others wrote the name of our Savior in a language that was not Hebrew. If these men were permitted, inspired even, to write the name in Greek, we are also permitted to write and speak the name of our native language. The historical fact is that the New Testament was written in Greek. Therefore, the doctrine of the Hebrew-only sacred name is made invalid. This conclusion will be reached by even the most casual thinker who has the facts at his or her disposal. Therefore, sacred name movement teachers are compelled to fight a futile battle against an obviously original Greek New Testament. One final point is that the original language of Adam was different than the Ugaritic language of Abraham. The Ugaritic language of Abraham was different than the Egyptian language of Moses and the Israelites in Egypt. The Phoenician language adopted by the Israelites 600 years after they came into the Promised Land is not the language of Adam, Abraham, or that of Moses. And finally, although there is a great affinity of Paleo-Hebrew to the Aramaic, these are different languages. God spoke in each language, and in each one described himself by names and titles. We have no proof or evidence that God insisted upon one continuous pronunciation for his names or titles, and these names and titles were the same in all languages. If the evidence of such a fact of proof is missing, how can any man claim something to which God gave or left no testimony? Either the claim is false on the face of the assertion, or it is false because a claim so important, if it were true, would have an abundance of testimony, and none exist. In conclusion, I'll mention the gospel itself, because it's the power of God unto salvation, and it speaks of repenting and believing in the gospel, which is that Christ took the wrath of God that we deserved, in exchange, we were given the Holy Spirit and a new life that would cause us to desire God and to be more like Him. This is the message that Paul preached, to repent and to believe. It wasn't to say the name of God correctly. I feel like the sacred namers are like the Galatians, and that they have fallen for the false teachings of some false brothers, who were teaching them that they needed to go back under the law of Moses to be saved. Paul wrote a letter to the Galatians basically doing as I'm doing right now, debunking their false teachers. He used his experience and their experience, as well as one of the most intense Old Testament Bible studies recorded in Scripture, to show them that they had been fooled and were under bondage. There is every indication that the Galatians, for the most part, repented and turned from the false teachings. I think that you might consider turning from them too. If this video has helped you, or if you just liked it and you know some people that hold these beliefs, please send this video to them or burn a copy on DVD and give it to them. Or join me in prayer that this video will help them in some way. Thanks for your time.